Would you like to just list the, the races you took part in? The first single-handed race suggested by uh, Blondie Hadler took place in 1960. Next one? The next one was in 1964, and they became a four-yearly event. It became established. In the beginning, nobody wanted to know about it. It soon became an, a recognized event in the international yachting calendar, and the agreement was we would run every four years. This first was in 1960, the next was in 64, the next one was in 68, but I didn't take part, although I wanted to very much. In between, there'd been the golden, the Sunday Times Golden Globe, which is all enmeshed in this racing. And then they, the races took place every four years, so it was 60, 64, 68, 72, I didn't take part in that, 76 came along, and by this time, Philip, our son, We'd already lost one son and buried him. And Philip, by then, was over 21. And I had the bright idea, which she, uh, this is outrageous, that we would build two boats for the 1976 transatlantic race, the first father and son entry in the event. I phoned Blondie up. He was delighted. And we had a lot of help from Blondie again. And we built the boats. And it was a total disaster. As far as I was concerned, it was a wipeout. This was when you had the accident. Yes. Which we'll, we'll come back to. But uh, when was the last big, big race which you entered? Well, after the 76 race, where I nearly lost my life, I should never have gone when we were building the boats. And it's a major undertaking. Just build two 38-foot ocean racing vessels. It's a major task. For two people, it's a massive task. It's also extremely expensive. I had persuaded myself it's going to be much cheaper to build two boats because you get economies of scale, don't you? That's, a, that's, that's about as dull as you can get. And also, boats are like houses. It's a romantic idea to build a boat. And they always turn out more expensive than you think, by probably a power of four. I was in... Port Talbot, living in Sunray with my uncle, when the city of Swansea was bombed by the Luftwaffe. In 1941, there, there was a prolonged bombardment, an aerial bombardment, lasted three days, killed uh, several hundred people, injured seri seriously injured four or five hundred more, destroyed the centre of the city, put the uh, at that time, Swansea was a, an important oil Im importing place, tankers and so on. And I can remember it vividly in my mind, the first night of the aerial bombardment, that the whole of Swansea Bay was lit up and you could see flames rising. I mean, they destroyed the town, absolutely devastated the centre of the city. A lot more people would have been killed, but of course they, they concentrated on the docks where not many people lived in the dock area. And uh, the city the, the city centre was a, a business place and not many people lived in the, in the business. But there were there still a lot of casualties. The next day, my uncle took me in the car to Swansea. I was only a boy. And... Lo and behold, when we were sort of walking around the rubble, here comes a group of people. And in the middle of the group, or leading the group, there was the Prime Minister, Mr. Winston Churchill. And there he is. And his wife Clemmy alongside him, and on his left was his bodyguard, who never left the place without his service revolver. <laughs> Those were the days, weren't they? Anyway, there's, there's Winston Churchill walking down the street after the, the night after the bombing of Swansea. And I was there. And when he passed, he got to us, my uncle took off his hat and he shouted, hip, hip, hooray! There were about six or seven people on the street and they all shouted, hooray! And Winnie Churchill looked over to us and smiled and gave us his two-finger salute. And I can remember that vividly as if it was yesterday, believe me.
This is the place. This is definitely the place for a seaman. Aboard a massive staysail schooner under 10,000 square feet of canvas, reaching across a freshening trade. And while we're enjoying ourselves, we're making money. Marvelous. Not too long ago, in these self-same waters, we could have been aboard a ship no bigger than this, making the middle passage of a slaving voyage out of Liverpool or Bristol and carrying down below decks three or four hundred unfortunate people to a strange new continent. Today it's rather different. There's been a sea change. And now the cargo pays us for the privilege of working here. Come on, come on. But now we've got the old girl close hold on the starboard tack. And she's doing the thing she was built for. Sailing along in the middle of the night. At the end of the graveyard watch. And Toby and I, probably the only people aboard who are awake. We're carting passengers around the island. It's the only way you can make the operation pay. It's the only way which these big schooners are going to be kept sailing. If the breeze keeps up, if Toby keeps, pay her off a little, Toby. If Toby keeps it all full, we'll be up to English Harbor just after dawn tomorrow. And it'll be the end of another cruise.